why are we going to learn a new programming language? Um, and most of you um, already have some experience with several programming languages, um, probably at least in Java and C and C++, um, hopefully in some other languages as well. So what's the point of learning a new programming language? Yeah. OK, great. Yeah, so you got right to the answer I was hoping for, which uh, usually people don't get to that quickly. Um, the, the best reason to learn new languages, at least if you're academics, is because you want to be able to think about things in a new way. Right? The power that languages give you is as a tool for thought. Right? They're also, especially when we use them as programming languages, well, they're a tool for expressing programs that eventually execute. But the, the most important property languages have is changing how you think. So here's some examples from other fields. So this is what music notation looked like um, in 1500s. On the right side, this is what music notation looked like a couple hundred years later. What's the biggest difference between those two? The stems are connected. OK. Um, so that's the difference. Why is that important? Is that a big deal? Does that change the way you think about music? OK, good. So that's a nice cosmetic change. It makes it easier to read. May change a little bit, you know, thinking how things are connected by drawing the stems. I don't think it's as important as, as another big change here. Yeah. Ah, yeah, the bars, right? The music before 1500, there were no bars. There was no timing to synchronize it, right? If you were writing music in a language that didn't have measures, well, you wrote, you know, the two parts. And they were sort of loosely synchronized, but there was no sort of sense of everything has to fit into some particular box, right? That you had four beats, however many beats were in a measure, and you had to keep up that same rhythm throughout. Is that a good or a bad thing, that music notation changed to have measures in it? Does it increase or decrease the range of music that people would think about writing? Yeah. Good, yeah. So it, it certainly made it easier. Uh, it made it more likely that what the composer wrote down and what the performance played was what was intended. And I, I would call that sort of increasing the truthiness of the notation. Right? It said, I can write down using box notation. And someone who has this written out, you know, whether it was in 1732 or today, is going to play it with the same rhythm that Bach intended. Whereas someone who just has this notation is probably going to play things very differently. It's, it's much less clear what the composer intends there. With. Are there any ways that this reduces the expressiveness of music? Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. So it's forcing you into these measures, right? It's very literally saying everything has to fit into these boxes and into this structure. Taking that freedom away from the performance, it's also limiting what composers can do, right? If you've got to think about everything that you write fitting into this measure structure, um, that certainly limits the music you could write. So more modern music sometimes said, well, we don't want those constraints, and you end up with notations like this. I have no idea how you would figure out how to play that. There's probably some more explanation, but these are the kinds of things that, that composers end up doing to say, I don't want to be confined by these notation conventions. And here's another one. Does anyone know this piece? This one's actually pretty easy to play. If we wait long enough, I'm playing it right now. Yeah. So this is John Cage. The performer is supposed to be silent for 4 minutes and 32 seconds, but there's actually three parts to it and a lot of directions. It's not quite that simple to just be silent. So languages are important because they change the way we think. And this is true whether we're talking about music notation or natural languages or programming languages. And at a very sort of rough level, these languages cause you to think about different things. Right? So if you're writing programs in Java or C++, well, they're designed around objects. You're supposed to be thinking about objects. The language encourages you to always think about objects. The syntax sort of forces you to create classes and think about things as methods and objects. You can fight that and try to write other kinds of programs, but that's not what the, the language is designed for. Other languages, and I hope some of you have, have had some experience with functional languages and will certainly use uh, functional aspects of Rust in this class, they're all about thinking about procedures. Right? The language provides good ways for you to pass around procedures, for you to do things with procedures. If you're programming in those languages and, and programming effectively in those languages, you're spending most of your time thinking about procedures other languages you're thinking about assignments. That's the, the biggest thing that, that languages do, is change how you think. The other thing they do is sort of 
similar to what we said operating system. Right? They provide abstraction. So what's a variable? Say that's in, in your Java or C code. What does that mean? OK, so that's maybe how it's implemented. What it means is you're getting some abstraction, right? So this name x is now an abstraction for some state in memory or some location in memory, maybe. Um, but as a programmer, you're not really supposed to be thinking about that. Right? You're thinking about x as something that is a reference to some, some place. And in that place, there's something that represents the value 7. But it's really providing an abstraction. It's providing some abstraction to however that is stored in the machine. If it's a language like Java or C++, well, you don't need to know whether that's in a register or it's stored in memory or it's stored somewhere else. It could be stored in any of those places. Um, the language is giving you an abstraction that hides that from you. And the more you hide things, well, that's a good thing, right? If someone's learning to program, writing their first program in Java, or hopefully in some simpler language like Python, they shouldn't have to understand about registers and the stack and the heap and virtual memory and the disk and uh, the caching system and all of those things code, to, to be able to write code like this. But the fact that you're getting this abstraction, you're no longer able to control all those things either. So if you wanted to make sure that x was in a register, well, in Java, you couldn't do that. Um, in C, you could. Okay, so, so, so that gives you more control. Why do we have so many languages? There must be you know, many thousands of programming languages out there. Do we need them all? So there was a time back in the 60s when big effort, mostly led by IBM, was to make PL1 as the one language that you could do everything in. How many of you are programming in PL1? So it didn't succeed. Why do we need more than one language? Do you think if you, you know, were really smart and people did this today, maybe you could do better and design a language that was the one language that you could use for, for all kinds of programming? OK, good. So it sounds like you know, maybe there's some trade-offs. What are the big trade-offs? And why can't we get everything we want in one language? OK, so speed versus ease of use. Why is that a trade-off? Why do we have to give up speed to have ease of use? OK, good. So maybe what we need for speed is lots of control. And in order to have lots of control, we have to expose lots of details to programmers. So that means maybe we have to give up some ease of use to have more speed. So maybe we need two programming languages. We need one that gives you a lot of control and one that gives you ease of use. Is that enough? I see. OK. So um, I'm not sure I'm totally understood. You're saying it's, it gets more expensive to provide more control or less control? Yeah, so there's more, like you need more things to support the language. So there's a bigger runtime system. You need a more complex, more expensive, uh, more expensive compilers. Um, and that, I think, probably until about 1970 was a pretty good reason to need more languages. I think today, you know, compilers are not among the most expensive programs you run. The uh, compiler takes up a lot less memory than your video player. Probably the cost of the compiler you know, mattered a lot until you know, 1990 or so. It doesn't matter too much today, but it certainly has had a big impact on the history of languages and operating system development, that cost. The cost of the runtime still matters today if you need to be sort of under, uh, under 10 cents or so. So you need you know, probably 10 to 15 cents of silicon to support a Java VM. If you need your system to run in you know, just a few cents of silicon, then you might need to compromise on the runtime a little bit. But it's got very inexpensive to have a, a pretty rich runtime. Yeah, so definitely the, the sort of runtime costs of how efficiently it, your program executes, that's going to depend a lot on the layers that you have to go through. So if there are many abstraction layers that you have to go through to do something, that's going to make it more expensive to, to run your program. Um, yeah, what was your? I say, okay, so yeah, so, so you're, you're advocating we need more than two languages because there are lots of different people and people think in different ways and like different things and are um, more effective in, with different tools. And I think that's a, a very good argument that um, you know, some people like semicolons and some people don't and some people like you know, white space having impact on syntax and some people don't. These are very sort of subjective personal things and there's no correct answer to them. And at the you know, bigger level, things like functional programming versus imperative, um, those are things where you know, different people are better at thinking different ways. So do we really need different, so, so the suggestion was you know, because we try to solve different kinds of problems, like whether we're building a web application or an Android application or something to run on a watch, um, 
we need different languages for that. The question is, do we really need different languages or do we just need good libraries? And maybe it's not that clear where you draw the line. But I, I think in a lot of cases, having a good library is probably most of what you need. And it doesn't matter too much the language um, once you're talking about sort of that level of what kind of application you're building. The first thing I, I want to emphasize, and, and not all of you have had the theory class yet, um, but you should have at least enough understanding of theory to know that there's no difference in the actual set of programs that you can run. All of these languages that we're talking about are universal languages. They're all powerful enough that you can simulate every other language in them, that you can write a simulator that si simulates a Turing machine and simulate any program that you want. There's no difference in power in terms of what computations you can express. So the, the reasons that we need languages have to be about engineering issues and about human use issues and about subjective things. But there are some very fundamental engineering trade-offs in languages. And I think we've touched on most of these. The, the how easy it is to use was the first one that was brought up. And, and I'm going to call that expressiveness. That may be a little bit different from easy to use. But so part of expressiveness is how short can your programs be versus how much extra redundant information do you need. So if you have a very expressive language, a very short program is enough to do a lot. We talked about control, that if you want to be able to control low-level aspects of how your program runs, then your language has to provide you with abstractions that expose those details to you. These things seem to be in conflict. The other properties, um, and I don't know a real English word that means this, and I don't use truthiness the way Stephen Colbert does here. I'm using the way it should be defined, which is a program is truthy if it does what the programmer expects it to do. That is a property that is often in disagreement with expressiveness. That if it's very easy to describe things and you don't need a lot of code to describe things, that means you don't have any redundancy checking. It's more likely that the program means something different from what the programmer thought. And we uh, saw that with the music example. Having the measure lines inc increases truthiness, but sacrifices expressiveness. And the final you know, big property is, is, is safeness. And this often conflicts with e efficiency, which we didn't list as one of the properties here, but often increasing safety has some efficiency cost. So it's difficult to achieve all, all of these at once. If our goal is to do things like build operating systems, or at least do lower level systems programming, where we care about performance a lot, where we want to build systems like web servers or operating systems, which of these should we emphasize? We have to make trade -offs. Control, OK, good. So it sounds like we definitely need control. Certainly, if we're writing an operating system kernel, we need control at the level of we need to look at a particular location in memory and be able to put something there. So we need a lot of control. Uh, what else do we think? Yeah, so we certainly want a lot of safety. These two seem to be pretty much in conflict as well. If you can have enough control that you can do arbitrary things with arbitrary locations in memory, that sounds pretty dangerous. You could do something with memory, or your program could have a bug in it that an attacker could exploit to put something arbitrary in memory as well. So these are trade-offs. Right? And it looks like we're always going to need to sacrifice truthiness for expressiveness. If we look at languages that have high expressiveness, right, we have one line of code to print hello, whereas in Java, you need a whole page of code. It's easier to make mistakes in those languages because the compiler can't check as much. You don't have static type checking. You don't have some of the checking that, that these languages give you. Our goal really is to be over here. We want to have high expressiveness and high truthiness. What about control versus safety? So what's a language that gives you a high amount of control? Yeah. So C is probably the example you've used most. It gives you a ton of control, very little safety. Right? It doesn't even check when you go outside the bounds of an array. You can walk off the end of memory, very efficient, because it's not doing any checks for you, very, very dangerous. Where would a language like Java fit on this graph? Yeah, so it's fairly safe gives you very little control. What we really want is to, to be up here. This is really pretty close to what Rust actually achieves. It's definitely safer than Java. There are many bugs that you can have in Java programs that the Rust compiler will not allow you to have. But it gives you a, nearly as much control as C. So it's probably a little less control than C. It doesn't quite let you, you know, bash on arbitrary locations in memory the way C does, but it does give you a lot of control about how things are stored in memory, enough to get very high efficiency. How can we do that? We said these things were, were trade-offs, that you have to give up one to get the other. How are we able to get both? Is it totally magic, or are we giving up something else? 
Okay, so maybe we had to give up something else. Maybe we had to give up expressiveness. We gave up a fair bit of expressiveness, and expressiveness is a little more subjective. And there are some things that definitely are much harder to express in Rust than they would be in C or Java. One of the things that you need to do to get the safety is provide a lot more information to the compiler about how you're using memory. This is more than just adding the measure bars, right? It's saying you have to control how you can refer to objects. Whereas in Java, you can pass pointers to objects around any way you want and rely on, on the Java runtime to, to manage that. So, so we did give up some expressiveness for it, but not as much as you might think. What's the other way that you can get both of these things without giving up too much? Yeah, so one, one possibility, and this was sort of, sort of the vision behind PL1 and vision behind various other languages that try to be all things to all people. Right? You could say, well, we're going to provide you know, some very high-level abstractions. We're going to provide some low-level ones. We're going to provide all these different points in one language and let programmers figure out what to do. And there's a lot to be said for that. right? It gives programmers a lot of options. Where you really lose from that, if, if you want to guarantee safety, if you want to make safety a priority, you don't want to give programmers these options. Rust does not take that approach. It encourages you to do things in a way that's going to be safe. Or, sorry, it requires you to do things in a way that's safe, because it won't let you compile it if it is not safe. And, and there, there are uh, different levels of safety, but that certain guarantees like memory safety have to be there for, for your program to compile. So it doesn't provide you those, those options. The real answer to this is really it's, it's progress. These languages, C and Java, um, well, C you know, goes back to the 1960s. Java you know, goes back to the 1990s. There's been a lot of advances in both language design and how to create compilers and implement languages. And those advances allow you to actually do smarter things in compilers and smarter things in language design that overcome some of these trade-offs. There are still fundamental trade-offs between expressiveness and control. You, you definitely do have to give up some expressiveness and some ease of use. So it's certainly a lot harder to write a Rust program than it is to write a Python program that does the same. You are all experienced programmers now, so should value the control and safety that you get over the ease of use. And it depends a lot on what you're doing. But if you're doing systems programming where safety, robustness, and scalability and efficiency all matter, then you're willing to give up some ease of use and expressiveness for control and safety. What I want you to do before the next class, so I actually need to be out of town Thursday, so I won't be here, but it will be a very valuable class, so the, the TAs will all be here, or as many of them that can make it, and you're going to have a chance in Thursday's class to get help getting everything set up that you need for this class and making progress in what's problem set zero of going through the Rust tutorial. So you should bring uh, a laptop to class, um, and you should get started on the things on the action items that are posted on the class notes, especially getting uh, things downloaded and set up. Because if you haven't done that before class Thursday, you'll spend most of the class waiting for things to download, which won't be that useful.